Well, welcome today to the Shepherd Summit. My name is Tim Cart, and I'm an assistant here to Pastor Sexton at uh, Temple Baptist Church. And he asked me today to come and share an interesting theme, the dangerous road to socialism in America and how it will affect Baptist churches. So before we get started today, there's a couple things we want to share with you. And Pastor Sexton wanted to make sure that uh, you had the information for the upcoming First Amendment Conference, our First Freedom. Uh, this conference is on April the 11th through the 13th. Uh, please make note of that. If you're in the area and you can attend, that would be great. Or you can watch it online. But this uh, conference, we are praying, of course, continually for revival. But we're praying especially for these men that Pastor has chosen to come and to share with us, Dr. Richard Land. Uh, the Lord has used this man politically in the United States in a, in a way for uh, teaching many people and preserving freedoms. Dr. Stephen Flick, he's a professor at Crown College, and he is an expert on the history of religious freedom in America. Herb Samworth, as well as an adjunct faculty here at Crown, and then attorney uh, Dr. David Gibbs will be with us. The Lord is using him uh, as well uh, in a great way in these days in which we're living, uh, especially in California, helping with churches there that have been shut down and closed because of COVID. We need to pray for these men, and we need to pray for this conference. And uh, it's dealing with the fact that Christian people need to be aware of what God is doing in these days and how close we are to lose our freedom. Let's go ahead and pray and uh, we'll get started. Please make note of those uh, dates again. April the 11th through the 13th. That's a Sunday through Tuesday. Uh, Sunday morning, evening, Monday morning and evening, and Tuesday morning and evening. There's going to be a man from China who will be sharing his testimony of what it's like uh, to live in a country where you've never had freedom as we have here. We'll have someone from uh, another country where there's no freedom, leading churches, and then a person from Venezuela who lost all of their freedom and uh, several other special events and things going on. You don't want to miss it. Uh, make a point to uh, be involved in what the Lord's doing. The First Amendment Conference, April the 11th through 13th. Don't miss it. Well, let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing today on what we will be sharing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to Thee, and Lord, we come gratefully. We ask Your blessing on this time today. Thank You for these pastors that You've used to be such an encouragement to our pastor. And thankful, Lord, that uh, there's help as we look to Thee. And Lord, I pray that You would be glorified in this time. In Jesus' name I pray and ask these things. Amen. Just a quick word about me. I'm originally from West Virginia. I grew up in a coal camp. My father was a coal miner. And the Lord called me to preach when I was 17 years old. I didn't know I should tell people about that. In one church service, I went forward, and thankfully the youth pastor came and said, What are you praying about? I said, I don't know. Just thankful to God, he called me to preach. And then he was real excited about that. And just a few months after that, I found myself here at Crown College, the, one of the very first students in 1991. After graduating and serving here at the church for a while, we were taking trips around the world, uh, preaching the gospel and helping in Bible institutes. And one of those trips was to Venezuela. And I went there. I couldn't speak Spanish. I had a Spanish uh, man with me. And there was a line to get into the banks. And it usually takes three or four hours to cash a check in Venezuela. So we gave out some gospel literature and we're speaking to people for about, I don't know, an hour or so. And I would ask each one of those people, have you ever heard this? And they would all say no. And, and uh, not one person there had heard the gospel in that line. And God used that in a unique way to give me a burden to go back to Venezuela. I went back about three or four times and then went back to live in 1999. I was there for about 13 years. And as we arrived in 1999 to stay, uh, that's when Hugo Chavez was elected president of Venezuela. He led a coup attempt in 1992 and was jailed for two years, then sought exile in Cuba, and then came back and beat a woman candidate who was uh, Miss uh, Venezuela, and he won the election. And soon after his uh, uh, win, he implemented uh, socialism 
And the rest is history. Uh, Venezuela was the fifth largest oil producing country in the world, very wealthy, and uh, had so much potential. In less than 10 years, they're now uh, probably, either, probably below South Sudan. They're probably either the second or the, the uh, lowest uh, country in uh, every area. And we lived through that, and we had to uh, counsel Christians. We had to try to help pastors. We had planted some churches. We're helping other national pastors plant churches. And it's the danger and uh, the um, implementation of socialism, first it was just at a distance. and One learned how to do what they had to do, but it just got closer and closer and closer and closer until finally all the power, all the power was in the hands of a few people in the entire country. They had taken over, of course, the military, the police, the banking systems. They would direct federal funds, passing all governors and state governments directly to uh, groups of people living in communities. And that group of people were the ones who would spy on you and determine uh, what they needed in that community, a school or who could travel, who couldn't travel. And so it was very sad to see the indoctrination taking place. You would ask children, who are the greatest socialists or who are the greatest political leaders? Well, Jesus Christ and Che Guevara. They were the greatest socialists that ever lived. Uh, the president, uh, Hugo Chavez, of course, his last attack, I'll share that with you, was against pastors and churches. But the Lord allowed us to live through that. And still yet, the churches are very strong in Venezuela. Uh, the churches, uh, new churches are being planted there. Thousands have came to faith in Christ. But it's sad to hear of your friends eating out of the trash, um, friends dying in the hospitals because there's no medicine. Uh, five million Venezuelans have left the country, and uh, so it is just a horrible mess. And all of it is because of socialism. So I'm going to try my best, <laughs> please pray for me, um, try to help uh, uh, what I can in this. You know, Pastor Sexton, a few months ago after we had to close uh, our church facilities from attenders for just a few months, he led strongly, Pastor Sexton did. And he led strongly, and we've been working at things and coming back. And so these are some things I want to share with you that we've been trying to implement here under Pastor Sexton's leadership. And then having to deal with these new attitudes and uh, new uh, narratives and things like that. So I pray and hope that it's a blessing. i tell you what I'm going to do. Let me tell you what I'm going to say first. All right. So I may, you know, I used to be a rabbit hunter. I had champion rabbit beagles and my coon hound won first place in a train contest. So I like rabbit trails. So let me tell you an outline I'm going to follow because I may get on a rabbit trail, may think of a story or something to tell you, and I don't want to get you confused, all right? So uh, here's what I'm going to tell you. Uh, number one, you can write it down. First thing we want to do is understand the deception. Understand the deception. Number two is we have to refuse accommodation. Refuse accommodation. And number four, define contextualization. Define contextualization. And then number four, we want to lead toward revitalization. So if you wrote that down, we're going to understand deception. Number two, we're going to refuse accommodation. Number three, we're going to define contextualization. And number four, we're going to lead toward revitalization. So let's start with Psalm chapter 12. If you have your Bible, look at Psalm chapter 12 and verse 1. The Bible says, help Lord. Are you there? <laughs> I mean, a few months ago, we were thinking all of our ministries are closed down, hundreds of them. No one can come and attend our church services. And I hope, I think you found yourself at a point of help Lord. Well, it's going to continue. And uh, David prays, help, Lord. That word help is the same word in verse 5, safety. Safety, Lord, help. What a prayer. Help. <laughs> it says, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fell from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own, 
Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighting of the needy, how will I arise? saith the Lord, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried and a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. David experienced in his complete world, in verse 2, how people were speaking, vanity, emptiness, flattering lips, but that flattery was hypocrisy. It says, with a double heart do they speak. Now, I'm talking about understanding the deception. The seeds of socialism have been sown in the United States of America. You're going to reap what you sow. Today, we can see that after 60 years of sowing these seeds of socialism in America, we are beginning to reap them. And this book, I don't know if you read it, this book will tell you about those seeds. It's called uh, Socialist Don't Sleep. Christians Must Rise or America Will Fall. It's by Cheryl Chumley, and she does a great job to tell us all of these seeds that have been sown. If you want understanding about these seeds, you can go ahead and read this. Now, first you want to say, well, what is socialism? Well, it's like nailing jello to the wall. And it's uh, especially in our postmodern mindset with critical theory being applied to definitions. But let me read something to you, to you from this book, and uh, it's just so difficult to describe. Uh, it says this, A paper on socialism published at Stanford Online Resor uh, Resources offers a concise look at the uh, subtleties, subtleties of the system of socialism. So listen to this. It says, Socialism is a rich tradition of political thought and practice. Now, these are socialists writing this. It says, the history of which contains a vast number of views and theories, often differing in many of their conceptual, empirical, and normative commitments. In his 1924 Dictionary of Socialism, Angelo Rappaport canvassed no fewer than 40 definitions of socialism, telling his readers in the book's preface that there are many mansions in the house of socialism. Socialists have condemned capitalism by alleging that it is typically free, uh, features exploitation, domination, alienation, inefficiency. Socialists have deployed ideas and principles of equality, democracy, individual freedom, self-realization, and community and solidarity. And so, in other words, it's going to be hard for you just to define socialism today. Uh, we're talking about uh, understanding the deception. If something has 40 definitions, well, how in the world are you going to explain that? It's almost like the, our generation of defining gender. You can have as many genders as there are people today. It's so hard to define. But I want to help you if you write down this process. I want you to understand the deception. Here's the process. Number one, cultural socialism. Cultural socialism. Now, in Venezuela, we experienced the real political socialism. But in America, because of critical theory uh, applied to socialism, uh, it's really as a cultural, they come up with the idea of cultural socialism. Now, number two, political socialism. And number three, government socialism. Th this is a process that's happening in America. Now, let me explain that to you. Cultural political, and then the government. The cultural socialism is about capturing the minds, the ideas of people. It's about education. Boy, didn't that happen during COVID-19? Uh, the mindset of people changing, giving up their liberties for protection. So this cultural socialism in our postmodern mindset, there's no absolutes. You can't really define socialism. Sounds good to me. Ask someone what socialism is. They can't tell you. Uh, at the end of the day, they will say some things historically, like, well, they're going to take over all of government. Uh, they're going to control all of production and distribution. It's the opposite of capitalism. 
But the mindset today is uh, in the socialist, is the goal for the socialists. They want to capture the mind in the education. In Venezuela, they changed education. They did away with Columbus Day. They called it the Indigenous Resistance Day. They made calendars of great communist leaders and socialist leaders that needed to be celebrated. Uh, they began to erase their, uh, their history. They tore down some statues of Columbus. Uh, they also changed uh, their uh, flag. They added a star to their flag. The seventh uh, uh, political movement there, this is what they said. And there was a horse. It was Bolivar's horse, Simon Bolivar's horse. He's kind of like the George Washington of South America. And on their flag, on the shield, that horse lo was looking back and was running forward. And they were looking back to their history, where they'd come from, and going forward. And President Hugo Chavez said, what's that horse looking at? One day I watched, listened to him on TV. We don't want that horse looking back. Turn that horse's head around. We want to go forward. They were erasing their past. And that's, we see that happening in America today. It's cultural socialism. It's infiltrating within the educational process through media, through propagation, trying to capture ideas and the minds of people. Then that's going to move to political socialism. That's the vote. Boy, didn't we see that in our last election? What a bunch of confusion, all right? Uh, to win the vote. Uh, socialists love democracy. They don't like the, a republic democ uh, democracy, but they love democracy. And they will move that mindset to win the votes, to get the votes, and then it goes to a system, to government socialism, state-run, absolutely state-run, everything's controlled by the government, right? So if you have that process in your mind, then how is that being pushed forward? Well, the big idea being pushed forward today is collectivism. The word you, a word you may want to uh, understand, collectivism. Uh, basically, anything that is collectivism is not freedom. If you hear the idea of a group trying to control an individual, that's collectivism. And it has nothing to do with what is freedom. Uh, it is giving a group priority over each individual. Maybe you've heard about cancel culture. Now, here's the deception. Here's what I want you to understand. David said in Psalm 12, I look around me. I hear people talking to one another. It's all empty. Verse 2, I hear people flattering one another, and it has no substance at all. I hear that they're double-hearted. What they're saying and what they're doing is different things. He looks around him and actually says, The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. David says, They're lying to Saul about me. My whole world now around me is nothing but a bunch of deception and lies and flattery and emptiness. And it's all aimed toward me. All right? Now, here is the deception. The deception is they will not use collectivism. They're not going to try to get a group of people and publicly go against an individual. We see it in cancel culture, but we don't see it because they're trying to capture, deceive people and capture their minds. They're after the mind of our children. They're after the minds of our young people. And here's what they do. They will use personal rights. They will use personal rights as a pretext to further their goal of a socialistic government. Let me illustrate that to you. In Venezuela, I was listening to the radio one day, and a man said, came on and he said, Now listen, you own a car. You have a car. It's your car. Your name's on the title. You have a house. It's your house. But why are you so prideful? Why are you so uh, full of yourself? You know that car is really for your family. And you know really that house you have is for your family too. You know individualism is not the best thing, is it? And then just a few minutes later he says, Now we're thankful that President Chavez says that if you've been renting someone's private property for at least 10 years, that now belongs to you. Because... Why would you be so prideful and arrogant about having two houses or three houses? And you see, you would say, well, that was unbelievable. Yes, that's what we lived every day in uh, Venezuela. But here's, here's the point. 
in America. Cancel culture. How long is it going to take until someone says, you don't have the right to say that from God's word anymore? And uh, here's the point I want to make. Uh, Christ puts uh, principles above, or a Christian puts principles above their personal care. There's things that are legal. There's things that are moral. But there's things that are biblical. David grabbed on to something in Psalm 12. What did he grab on to? Well, the Bible says in verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. David said, well, the only thing I can hold on to is the God's word. And we know that we're going to face a battle. We're going to face a battle about us preaching the truth and speaking the truth in love. And we're going to have to face this collective group of people coming against you as a pastor or a collective group of people coming against people in our churches because they're on a process to get your mind. And if they can get your mind, they're going to get your vote. And if they can get your vote, then they're going to implement a system. And when that system is fully implemented, you don't have the freedom of speech that you had. You don't, you don't need the, uh, the freedom of assembly that you have. And so understand the deception. They're talking about individual rights, and they're using those as pretexts today. And they're pushing step by step in order that they, that they can implement collectivism. It's a deception. And behind that, no doubt, is Satan, the spirit of Antichrist. Now, what, what would I do? I encourage people to hold on to God's word. And uh, let's go to the next step here. So first, understand the deception. Number two, refuse accommodation. You know, unfortunately, churches in America and pastors have been doing this for, for years now. And, uh, you know, we've sown it and we're reaping it. Uh, what am I talking about accommodation? We're wanting the approval of the culture instead of God's favor. Uh, we've bought into a lie that in order to reach this culture, we have to become like this culture. Wow, if I'm really going to have an effective ministry, I really have to, in a certain way, accommodate some of these ideas that my people are telling me. And it comes from the pew to the pastor and then eventually finds its way in our college, Bible colleges and seminaries. But the pastor is the person that God has put there to say we're not going to accommodate the culture, especially the socialist ideas, all right? We're not going to seek the approval of the culture. We can have favor with God. You know, even, you know, even in Venezuela, <laughs> I, I was getting it left and right. I was a spy. I mean, families would say, I can't invite people to, your, to this church, to my family to your church. They just think you're a spy. And uh, we had to adjust a lot of things. Uh, they're serving as missionaries. And uh, thank God we followed God's plan about uh, having a self-supporting, self-propagating, and uh, self-leading uh, 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 church. And we see, saw national leadership rise. And we, I was, when the war was going on under President uh, George Bush over in the Middle East, I was accused of a, being a murderer. Uh, on and on I could go with everything. But I had to teach people. One Saturday I show up to go out. We usually had a small group of people, 20 people or so out, winning souls on Saturday, visiting. I showed up one day and there were two people. I said, where's everyone? Oh, they went to Caracas. Why did they go to Caracas? Because their employer said that if they didn't go March, they would lose their job. So they all went to March. And, I mean, what, what are we going to do? How, 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 what do you think is going to happen when it becomes a system? All right, it's in the minds today. We see it getting into the votes. But when it becomes a system, what are you going to do? You need to stop accommodating right now. Stop accommodating these things. And so I realized there's no way I could accommodate all this. There's no, the Bible's, you know. But I realized God could give us favor. Boy, didn't God give us favor. You know, if you live the Christian life and honor the Lord, speak the truth in love, and we'll talk about that, God can give you favor. We need God's favor today. And God's favor can make the difference. Now, COVID-19 
has revealed uh, something about all the pastors. COVID-19 revealed whether or not you were going to be an accommodating pastor or you were going to be a, a pastor that agreed with the ideas and attitudes of God. Now, we all know, all of us that were in ministry serving during these times, we know that all the people in our churches had so many different ideas. <laughs> they were watching the news, they were reading newspapers, they were listening to their families. And I know God gave you mercy. I mean, wow, I'm sure God's grace was with you to try to <laughs> help people and get everyone on the same page and understand uh, the fact of how the spirit of Antichrist was here and how people were fearing God. And, uh, but COVID-19 revealed you. And if you reflect on that, you'll know whether or not really you were an accommodating pastor or if you decided, no, uh, I'm going to agree with God and his ideas in this, okay? This world, Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, I'm sure you know this verse. But Romans chapter 12, we're talking about refusing accommodation. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. That word conformed means to be patterned after, just as if I had a piece of straight steel and I had a mold, and I took that piece of steel and I wrapped it around that mold. Uh, that that uh, mold became the pattern for that steel. The world system is not our pattern. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. God, God's uh, people are always facing pressure to be conformed to the manward way of thinking. So how does this affect us and the churches? Okay. Um, the last thing Hugo Chavez attacked uh, were pastors and churches. He said two things. He said, where are these pastors trained? If there's a pastor that didn't, was not trained for ministry in Venezuela, he cannot be a pastor. <laughs> oh, my. What did we all do? I went with them. Uh, we all went to seminary <laughs> to get a degree from Venezuelan colleges. And I had to go study again. And, uh, wow, you know, what, what was I going to do? They were going to come uh, check up on us and find out what was going on. And the second thing he did, and uh, the second thing he did, he said, what are they doing with all that money? They receive these offerings and tithes, and what are they doing? That was the last thing he attacked. Think for a moment. What did he have? He had the banking system. He had the military. He had the police. He had government officials. He had a majority of people standing with him. Once he had everything, the only thing left were these churches and pastors. And he, he attacked them, right? And what is the, the pretext of, of tragedy that is happening today? Uh, refusing accommodation means what? Write this down. What is Democrat is progressive, is socialist, is communist. Now there is a, a logical connection in these things. In our country, Democrat is progressive. You can listen to the news and they say, oh, Biden's being influenced by the progressives and the Democrats. No! <laughs> the Democrat is progressive. All right? Uh, then, progressive is socialist. Where is all this progressivism going? Just read the newspaper. See what's going on. It's going towards socialism. They're capturing the mind of people. They're pushing it to a vote. And then they're going to implement the system. And then is communist. You know, socialism is the front porch to communism, to the house of communism. And we can't be conformed. Now, re refuse accommodation. If we take the long view as a pastor, you want to teach your people we're not going to allow the world to be our pattern. We have to be renewed in our mind. They're going to bring out tragedies. They're going to bring out pretext after pretext. They're going to bring out stories of sadness. You know, I think of what's happening at the border. I mean, what are these people up to? 
Let me tell you, they need to close the border now. Now, I've been to Mexico, and I've witnessed two of those caravans walking through Mexico. Now, I was right here in South Knoxville a few months ago, and a lady said, hey, listen, you're a Christian. I need help. A man brought a young boy across the border. He's 13. They have him in construction 12 hours a day. He's sitting at home crying. I don't know what to do with that boy. I said, go get him and take him to the uh, uh, Guatemalan embassy. All right? I was in Guatemala, and a man said, you don't know me, but your church knocked on my door every Saturday. I was the key pin to run cocaine from Atlanta to Knoxville. And people from your church knocking on my door every Saturday telling me about Jesus. Once uh, They finally arrested me and put me in prison in Mexico. Miraculously, I got out. God opened the door for me. But in that prison, I knew exactly what I needed. I needed Jesus. Yeah. And he says, now I'm starting this church here in Guatemala, out in the jungles in Guatemala. Let me tell you, they, they, these cartels have these children marked. And these children's families will do what they tell them to do or they will kill their families in these countries. I don't know what these, uh, the, our government's going to do, but they're going to create a tragedy. They're going to create a pretext to all this and they're going to try to win the minds and the votes of people towards socialism. And we have, don't accommodate this stuff. I know there's Christians with tears and all this. Uh, they're not discerning. They are not discerning the deception that is going on. And they're just going to accommodate it. You as a pastor and as Christian workers and something I've had to do here is I have to refuse accommodation. And I have to understand that, that we're getting our, our, our call from the Lord. It's hard. I told you it was like nailing jello to the wall. Socialists are going to give you Jesus was a great socialist. One day, <laughs> I'll tell you this story. Hugo Chavez, he would usually spend about six to seven hours on television every evening. Books and the Bible, he'd hold up the Bible. And he said, I want to share with you about some socialists in the Bible tonight. And he talked about Ananias and Sapphira. And he said, God killed them. God killed them capitalists. They didn't want to give their money to the collective group of people to help poor people and to help those in need. And God killed them. Do you want to be one of them capitalists that God kills? And you're like, whoa, hold on. And it's like nailing jello to the wall. We live in that type of culture. There's no absolutes. People are following their opinions. But you as a pastor with the word of God, you understand that you can discern and say, we're going to do what? We're seeking God's favor. People aren't going to like what we may say, but we'll speak it in love. Uh, even people in our pews may be a little off taken. You know, you can come hang around Pastor Sexton, and this is a good thing for a while, and he'll help you <laughs> be able to explain things forcefully and uh, just, you know, water off uh, uh, the duck's back, right? And uh, so... Uh, encourage yourself and look to the Lord, but don't be accommodated. Don't let these ideas, and we have to teach it to our people because the accommodation, you're going to feel the pressure from the people in your pews. You're going to feel the pressure when you begin to speak about the, uh, uh, what's happening to capture the minds of our children towards socialism. They're, they're, they're going to come and say, why are you talking about elections? Why are you getting into politics for and you're going to have to show them we're not going to accommodate this. And then the third thing, very quickly, define contextualization. Now, most of us know, you know, theologically we're dealing with the idea of preaching the gospel so people can understand it. But most modern people take this contextualization and they want to make it conforming to the culture. And we see churches transforming them, uh, not being transformed by the Word of God, but conforming to the culture in order to reach the culture. But what I'm talking about is the local church. Define contextualization. What is the local church in the world? Well, um, it's the pillar and ground of truth. 1 Timothy 3.15, we won't read that. The pillar and ground of the truth. Uh, we're here for the truth. Ephesians 4.15 speaking the truth in love, defining that. But let me read in John chapter 15, verse 18. John chapter 15 and verse 18, it says this. 
If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If he were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. And let me read in John 17, 14 through 18. John 17, 14 says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil, from the evil one, from Satan. It says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And so we realize that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We have to define contextualization. We have to say Paul became all things to all men. He was saying, I don't want to offend anyone to give them the gospel. He wasn't saying he was becoming like them. He wasn't becoming a Jew again in order to win a Jew. He wasn't becoming a heathen to win a heathen. He was just saying, I've, I don't want to offend them as I give the gospel. But if the gospel offends, it offends the truth. We have to define that today more than ever. Why, what the church is, started by Christ and his disciples, empowered in the day of Pentecost, uh, given, uh, we have two ordinances, baptism, Lord's Supper, given the doctrine to continue the doctrine of the apostles. We talk about uh, the fact that we're here uh, in the world, we're light, we're salt, but we have to define that. Why? Here's the point. Pride. Self-centeredness. Who is the richest Venezuelan in the world? Hugo Chavez's daughter, the big-time socialist. I just heard a month ago, my wife's family called me in Venezuela, from Venezuela. They just opened a car dealership for a Ferrari's. Ferraris, the first two people that bought the Ferraris were two generals in the socialist military. Wow, socialism must work. <laughs> Who's the richest Cuban in the world? Oh, it's Fidel Castro's daughter. You know, do you really think that these people are doing what they're doing? These socialists will lie about their sacrifice, but they're in it for themselves. The most corrupt government that's ever existed are the socialistic governments. And they use that corruption as the pretext to capture minds and hearts and to win votes. And then they are worse in corruption than you've ever seen. And we see it playing out before our eyes today in our own country. Self-centeredness. And our churches, unfortunately, have been influenced by the culture to be self-centered. When we define what the church really is, it comes to say that we are to die to self. We need to uh, live a surrendered life. As a spiritual leader, as a pastor or a Christian worker, we are to lead and uh, this surrendered life, this death to self. Now, think about this for a moment. In Venezuela, syncretism, many churches, uh, Pentecostal churches especially, became Chavez churches. They actually would have the name in their churches. We are a Chavez church. Or they would say, we are a socialist church. Syncretism was unbelievable. And don't you think for a moment that this self-centeredness of these socialist concepts will not invade in the hearts and minds of the people in our churches? Yes, it will. And we have to define who we are as the people of God, as the church, and that means we take up our cross. We die daily. We follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And as it moves from the votes to implementation, you know, how many people have had wonderful conversations about our stimulus uh, checks and payments we got? You know, don't you think that affected some people's mindsets? You better believe it. Do you think that some people are going to think about that at election time? Some people... Yeah, of course. How, they're going to keep doing this, but God's people have to say, we're not here for ourselves. We're here for the Lord Jesus Christ. Does Calvary mean anything? <laughs> Christ died for us, was buried and rose again. He paid our sin debt. We are to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to die to self. In Venezuela, I was going to sell my car 
And the man said, no, I can't buy your car. You have to change your title. I said, well, it's a title. Here it is. got my name on it. What's wrong with it? He said, nope, that title no longer works in Venezuela. I said, what do you mean? Nope, got to get a new title. So I went to get a new title for my car. The title I had said that I was the owner of that car. When I went in to get the title, the new title, I got the new title and came out with my new title, it did not say that I was the owner of that car. It said that I had registered that car. Uh, you think about that. I didn't have any ownership of that car. It's just I just was the one who registered. I reckon who owned it, I don't know. They were doing that with house titles. They were doing it with everything collectively. And as this moves further and further, and depends on where you are in the United States of America, some of these things are m more pressured and put forward than other places here in America. But people will become self-centered because socialists are self-centered. They're self-serving people. They're sinners. <laughs> And, and that influence will come in the church, and we have to define contextualization. For 200 years, I, my friend told me this yesterday as an idea, 200 years, it's beneficial to be a Christian in America. Hey, if you're going to open a business, hey, join a church. <laughs> hey, get some prospects for your business there. Isn't it great being a Christian in America? And uh, our American Christianity is not New Testament Christianity. I'm talking about defining contextualization. And what are you going to do when it's no longer beneficial to be a Christian in America? How weak will churches become because they were never taught and led into Christianity, New Testament Christianity? It's not a self-centered life. It's not a self-serving life. It's about dying to self and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read you something here from a, a book by Erwin Lutzer. I'm sure you've heard it, maybe, maybe you haven't. It's about a testimony of a man who lived in Germany and dealt with the accommodation there. It says this, he says, I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I consider myself a Christian. We heard stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it because what could anyone do to stop it? There you go. But let's just accommodate it because what can, what can I do? Right? A railroad track ran behind our small church, and each Sunday morning we could hear the whistle in the distance and then the wheels coming over the tracks. We became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed by. We realized that it was carrying Jews like cattle in the cars. Week after week the whistle would blow we dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that we would hear the cries of the Jews en route to a death camp. Their screams tormented us. We knew the time the train was coming and when we heard the whistle blow, we began singing hymns. By the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard the screams, we sang more loudly and soon we heard them no more. Years have passed and no one talks about it anymore, but I still hear the train whistle in my sleep. God forgive me. Forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians yet did nothing to intervene. And the author says, do we hear the train here in America? Do you hear the train? <laughs> do you hear it coming? Oh no, let's just, you know, it can't get that bad. You know, they're just changing a few things about their educational processes and trying to get people thinking differently. Listen, it's going to move forward, and it's going to be pushed forward, no doubt, by the power of Satan. Um, Erwin Lutzer talk, talked about Christians in Rome. He said the Christians were not thrown to the lions because they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. You could worship any god you wanted in the Roman Empire. They were thrown to the lions because they refused to say that Caesar was Lord. They said there was one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, our Christianity today in America is being tested. And we have to define what it means, define the local church biblically. And we have to define that contextualization. Uh, in John 12, 24 through 46, it says, If a corn of wheat fall in the ground, it abideth alone. But if it die... It bringeth forth much fruit. That self-centeredness in our world is, is in, unfortunately, in the hearts and minds of a lot of Christians. 
Spiritual leaders have to die to self. Live a surrendered life. And if you're listening to the train today, that's God's call. If you see things that bother you, that's God's call to begin to live the Christian life. All right, so we're at the last point. We talked about understanding the deception. Basically, they're going to use personal rights to move to a collective idea, and we see that in cancel culture. We refuse accommodation. We want God's favor. <laughs> we want God's favor. We don't conform to the world. Uh, we're going to speak the truth in love. We have to define contextualization. We, we have to realize we're not here as a church to be like the world. We're here called to die to self and be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the last thing is lead toward revitalization. Lead toward revitalization. And I wrote this down, and maybe a better way to say it, I don't know, but a healthy church in a sick world. You know what I need? A healthy church in a sick world. You know what you need? A healthy church in this sick world. And by God's grace, God says we can have healthy churches in this sick world. What has made the difference in Venezuela? What has made the difference? You know, there, uh, two years ago, 2019, we were actually feeding 21 pastors. Now, thankfully, some of that has problems have been resolved. But now... Uh, they're facing other things, but what made the difference in Venezuela? Healthy churches. People who looked to the Lord died of self and said, well, everything we ever knew is gone. We'll probably never see it again in our lifetime if it does come back. But we know that God is leading us and we need to follow Him. And they desire to have healthy churches. And they're seeing people saved, churches planted. God's doing an interesting work there. God's being glorified, and we're thankful for that. But um, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, church at Ephesus. This church was planted by the Apostle Paul. Timothy pastored this church. On the outside, you can read it, wonderful church. But God looks on the inside. And as we think of leading toward re revitalization, we're talking about having a Christ-like church, a healthy church in the midst of this sick world. God's Word says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. That word left is a strong word. It means abandoned. Years ago, I preached a message on this. And I told a story of a teenage girl in a party. She was pregnant. She left the party, went in the restroom, delivered her baby, put the baby in a trash bag in the trash outside, and went back into the party. Thankfully, uh, they found the baby and survived, but uh, that happened years ago. You can Google the information about that. But she abandoned that baby. That, you would say, that's a horrible story. You know, we hear attitude, oh, well, I've been away from God, or... You know, I've been missing some church services. I just feel far away from God. No, I'm going to tell you, you have abandoned your first love. You have abandoned your first love. You intentionally made the decision to take Jesus Christ and throw him away. And that's a hard word. You've left your first love. And we're going to lead toward revitalization. We have to follow God's plan. It says in verse 5, Remember, number one, remember. Therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Number two, repent. And number three, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Now, the candlestick speaks of the church, the light, the influence. May I ask you a question today? What would it be? What would America be like? if the churches exist but have no influence. We have to lead toward revitalization. Pray for revival. God can send the revival. God can revitalize your life, revive your life, and revive your church. God can send a revival to our nation. Let's look at these things. Remember. Remember. Uh, let's remember... Uh, uh, this church at Ephesus can remember some great things. <laughs> Over the last 35 years, how Paul came out, Timothy was there. 
about how God used them in a great way, how they received that letter in Ephesus uh, to their church, and they were reading that letter, the epistle from Paul. Uh, some wonderful things, and God gives them some great uh, commendations. But on the inside, there was no life. It was gone. God says, remember. Now, we have to make a step, and I have to do this in my life. And in Venezuela, the churches were affected. They, they were stressed out. Um, it's just unbelievable. It's kind of like what this COVID has done to us. You know, churches in California cannot go in their buildings still. They're, the pastors are being fined. Churches are being fined in parts in our nation today. And what's God trying to tell us? Maybe He's trying to tell us that we have to trust Him to do what only He can do so we just don't, aren't maintaining a name, but we're trying to move forward with the Lord. And sometimes traditionalism, you know what traditionalism is? Traditionalism is holding on to the past and not wanting to change. Traditions is great. I praise the Lord, Christian history and our heritage that we have, we need to know it and study it. But traditionalism of holding on to the past without wanting change is just going to create maintenance. And when we remember, God said, you remember, you left your first love. Remember what it was like when you knew the Lord Jesus Christ, when you had the favor of God. When, when the church was what it should be in, in all aspects of glorifying God. It wasn't like the world. Then he says, repent. Oh my, the goodness of God leadeth us to repentance. God told the nation of Israel, he said, by my compassion. Actually, the word is pity, but it means compassion. By my compassion, my mercy. He said, it's because of my name's sake. He said, there's nothing I can see to offer mercy but for my name's sake. And that mercy is available for the name's sake of the Lord. The good, think of the goodness of God in our lives today. Think how good God has been to us. And our children will not experience that as we have. Pastor Sexton said this the other day. If our freedom in America is lost then there will be no America. If our freedom in America is lost, then there will be no America. We need to repent. Uh, we need to see the goodness of God. We need to confess our sins. Think in the past and, and recognize these things about a, things you've accommodated that you shouldn't have accommodated. This COVID-19 has given you a great opportunity to start again and start in repentance. And then the first works, that's evangelism. Our evangelism is not a, a uh, reaction. It is obedience. Now, I knocked on doors and witnessed to people in Venezuela. And, you know, I, I had to ask God for wisdom how to respond to some questions. People would put magazines in my face of babies and children that were killed in the Iraqi war. And he said, why, why do you want to identify with these murderers? Who are you? You know, you're going to come here and tell me something about love. Look at this, look at the picture of these kids you just bombed over in Iraq. And it was interesting. <laughs> I asked the Lord for wisdom, and I had to have the wisdom of the Lord to answer uh, those things. But I wasn't reacting. I wanted to obey the Lord in evangelism. And evangelism, here's the point I make. Evangelism is confronting our culture. It means that you cannot accommodate the culture and ex expect the approval of the culture and evangelize. We have an answer. The gospel's the answer. And we can preach the gospel. And uh, that's, if we really remember and repent, then God's going to lead us to do these first works, which is evangelism. You know, someone said, preach the gospel to yourself. And then he said, preach the gospel to believers to, for formation and, and, uh, and motivation and sanctification. Then he said, well, preach the gospel to the unsaved. But by all means, please, preach the gospel. And that's where we're going to come to. My conclusion is this. If there was an attack from the outside, the American soldier would stand up. If there was an attack on our country today, the American soldier would stand up to defend our freedom. There is an attack on the inside today. 
For some reason, it's, it's socialism's being accepted in these ideas. And who are the people that can stand up? Pastors and churches. The moral decay of our nation can only be answered by pastors and churches. You are the most important person at this hour. And your church is the most important institution in this hour. And so by God's grace, we can stand. America needs pastors and churches more than ever. And I hope this was helpful. I, I'm afraid to answer your questions. <laughs> you can send them in, and I'll have Pastor Sexton respond to your questions, all right? Well, let's go ahead. We're going to pray, and we're going to end. I hope it was helpful, things like that, but Lord bless. Thank you for your faithfulness. You guys encourage our pastor. Mm -hmm. You encourage our pastor so much, mm -hmm. and I know he wants to be an encouragement to you. Thank you for your uh, faithfulness. Encourage other pastors to get involved and if you need help with anything, uh, you know, Pastor says, get in contact. If you need resources or whatever, please get in contact with the church here, and uh, they will be so helpful. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're on the winning side. Uh, Lord, uh, the devil and deception is out there. Lord, help us, not to ha help us to have your wisdom not to accommodate. Help us to define who we are in our church in this, in this moment. And the Lord, we really need revival. Oh God, come down and stir hearts and awaken us, Lord. May there be revitalization in our lives and in our churches. And we'll thank you and praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.